Thank you, Alicia and young theologians of the group getting us started on the scripture for this World Communion Sunday. <clears throat> I actually took a whole semester's class in uh, seminary on the Book of Lamentations because, uh, as many of you know, I'm intensely interested in grief and loss as part of the journey of faith, and there's no better scripture to remind us of what that looks like than that book. Turning to the New Testament now, our gospel lesson for this morning is from Luke chapter 17. I'll be reading verses 5 through 10. So hear now the word of the Lord for all of us this morning. The apostles, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you may eat and drink? Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Luke's just uh, so easy to preach on these days. If we could get past that passage uh, igniting in our minds that this might have been used in the 19th century to... Uh, support the institution of slavery. Hopefully we can get to the heart of the passage, which is about faith and, and what it is and what it isn't. But that reminds us of what reading the Bible is and what reading the Bible isn't. We shouldn't be reading the Bible to find support for views we already have formed in the world. We should be reading the Bible to be convicted and to question the beliefs that we've formed in the world, and to perhaps repent. That is the main message of the Bible, so I would invite you to hear these words in this translation with that in mind as we struggle to do rightly by the word of the Lord. So that's about the word, and now about the image of the day for our young artist, which uh, helped grace the front of our bulletins every once in a while, which we really enjoy. What does your relationship with God look like? Where is the place where you feel like you relate to God in your life? Is it a certain place? Is it through a certain relationship with a person? How does your relationship with God look in the world to you? I'll be looking to be instructed by some of your insights. <clears throat> So some of you know that I was recently, this past week, in San Diego, California for a conference as part of my continuing education. So uh, the only way I could get there and get back in time to preach this Sunday was to fly. I haven't been doing a lot of flying lately. And it reminded me, doing this flying, of how good the airlines are with their rewards programs. <laughs> I mean, they've gotten this down to a science, y'all. Even, you know, it used to be Southwest would have you just line up according to when you were going to board, right? Well, now Delta's doing that. So every section, the main two, the main one, the Sky Priority, Comfort Plus, Sky Medallion, First Class C, I had to make a connection, so I kind of got over and over, memorize all these categories, and they have you line up so everybody can see who's got the most rewards or who's got the most money to pay for first class and who's in that last section that's going to be sitting in the back of the plane going like this most of the flight. Not only that, <clears throat> of course, I came back with a bit of a cold from California. It seems to be, uh, so you're not alone, Alicia. Um, not only that, do you sit in the back and kind of go like this the whole flight. If they happen to run out of food and drink or there's enough turbulence that they have to stop serving food and drink, if you're in the back, you won't get anything. And for a coast-to-coast -coast flight, that can be a long time. 
So that's how the world's rewards programs work, right? You're supposed to pay more to avoid those really nasty experiences, travel stories like one Mark and I have. We went nine hours between terminals where we were sitting in the back and there was, they ran out of food. And then by the time we got to the west coast in the wee hours of the morning, there was nothing open to get anything to eat. It was a long time. So one time I didn't pack anything in my backpack. So you learn. You start saying, okay, I better fly the same airline to get the reward so I don't get to stuck in the back. Or I pay a little extra to get that seat up front. That's how the world's rewards programs work. So it's only natural that we might think that faith works the same way. You come to church, you tithe, you tithe, you serve on session, you serve on session, you should have a better chance of avoiding life's unpleasant back row experiences. Running out of food and drink, getting bumped around, hearing the lavatory go, door going open and shutting in your ear all the time. Is that why we have faith? Maybe for some of us, on some days. But it's interesting to me that when we did the mission study for this congregation last year, and we're surveying you and having those sessions and engaging in conversations, so many of you told us that what was most meaningful to you about this faith community, that's in addition to a church, we are called a faith community, what was most meaningful to you was the relationships here that had touched you in some significant way. Maybe they had reached out to you when you felt like you weren't being seen. Or maybe they had really touched you when you were going through a time that you weren't sure you were going to be able to make it through at all. Relationships here had meant something to you. I don't recall, those of you on the mission study team, correct me if my memory is wrong here, I don't recall anybody saying that they came to this church and found it meaningful because this is where you learned about Reformed theology and who God was. I don't think anybody returned that kind of response. So, even in the church, it's hard to get clear about what we're putting our faith in. Do we believe in God the Father Almighty or just the people that come here and who mean so much to us? who are willing to keep saying that annoying Apostles' Creed even when they're not sure they really believe everything in that. So it's World Communion Sunday, the year 2019. The world that we're living in is increasingly secular, increasingly putting its faith in science and the abilities of human beings to figure out what's true and what isn't. Next Sunday, you know David Remington and I will begin a conversation about science and faith and here today we have scripture passages that really ask us to examine what role does faith have for us in an age when science can give us so much certainty about what we're dealing with in life. I mean, why bother with faith if it can't do that? So in some ways I think our quest for certainty and our, our relentless pursuit of the scientific method to give us ever more certainty about so many things, even to the the activity of genetics making us who we are makes it really hard for people to see why, why bother with faith? What is the rewards program for having faith in God? But then we come to these passages and find that it's not just our age that finds it hard to have faith in God. Jeremiah and Jesus are both lamenting the way that life's hardships and relentless pressures hack down our faith, either little by little or all at once or everything. So most of Lamentations is just that, a lament over all the tragedy that's happened to Judah and Jerusalem. And the verses that we heard from chapter 3 are the only ones in the whole book that have any hope or any faith that is expressed in God. There's five chapters in the book. So the way the lectionary has us read both chapter 3 and chapter 1 in about equal portions can give you a mistaken idea that this is like a psalm where it's about half lament and then half praise and thanksgiving. It's not. It's about 90% lament and 10% praise and faith in God that 
could still be seen as good and a life of religious observance that actually rewards you with something like shalom, healing and wholeness. And Jesus, here in this passage, knows very well the lack of faith in the apostles. He was always questioning their motives for following him. Who's the greatest? Remember that story? Who's going to get to ride the messianic coattails into heaven? Or even better, to ride them into the kingship of Judah. The disciples clearly think that Jesus' rewards program will be even better than Delta's. First class, all the way, this world and the next. And I don't know that there might not be a few of us who are right there with them. Maybe it's not all the time, but maybe some of the time. We expect our faith to sort of be God's rewards program if we have enough faith or the right kind of faith and the right things or the right interpretation of the Bible. God will reward us by answering our prayers the way we would like to see them answered. I'm sure that's why our session members and committee members work all those unpaid hours on behalf of the church. They know they're getting their rewards. I think maybe we should start asking them to submit a net worth statement at the beginning of their term and then another one at the end of the term so we can all see how much God has rewarded their bank accounts for all their countless hours. You know I'm being satirical, right? <laughs> you know that. Because there are churches who do preach that sort of gospel. That you will receive what you ask if you have enough faith and if you don't receive it it's because you don't have enough faith I'm not saying that at all because why would Jeremiah or any of the Hebrews exiled to Babylon return to a God who would allow them to be destroyed because their faith wasn't good enough and yet in chapter 3 we hear the Lord is my portion says my soul therefore I will hope in the Lord. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wait quietly. Everybody's favorite thing to do. The Bible says over and over again, faith in the Lord does not reward you with immunity from tragedy, but it does reward you with a place to lament and to heal and to find that even in the midst of that tragedy, there is a God that is good. There is life that is good. It might not be the same, but it is still good. A place like a faith community where you can be and experience that kind of lamentation, that kind of healing, and that kind of hope. It gives you a relationship with God that allows you to, to have relationships that mean so much to you in the good times and the bad. It turns out the rewards program of faith is nothing more, and yet this is everything, to just have a relationship with God who is there through the turbulence, and through the smooth rise of life. Jesus' sayings in Luke also tell us that we often expect the wrong things from faith, which is why we have so little of it. Faith should set us free from fear. It shouldn't make us fear that we're doing it wrong. It should give us blessed assurance along the way. In the bad times, a covenant relationship with God rewards us so that we don't get too caught up in these bad times. We don't let despair become our God. God exists outside the despair, outside the bad thing. This is a place for lament and healing and hope. And then in the good times, a covenant relationship with God still rewards us because we don't get too attached to the good times, thinking they're going to last forever and this must be my reward for being such a good person. Everybody should listen to me and do what I tell them. Nobody ever feels that way in here, I know. The relationship with God itself is our reward. Not anything else we might receive in this life or the next. 
That's the rewards program of faith. As I've come to understand it, through the Bible, the biblical witness, through my own life, through what you have already said, that relationships can take you through places you never thought you could go by yourself. God is going with you to gather in this community, in those places. So I just want to say, and I'll end with this, if you're out there in the pews, not sure of this whole God thing, Reformed theology, the triune God is exactly for you and how you experience faith, but you know this community of people is, and the community out work, outreach work that we do is, and the music and the education are, know that you are not the only one who feels that way, and all these things are the gifts of God for the people of God, just as the cup and the bread are. And we are asked not to put faith in these gifts, but in the God who gave them. And the God who gave them, who goes with us into the world where there is going to be hardship, who goes with us into this life and the life after this life, that we don't know what will be like. God going with us gives us a place to lament and to heal and to find hope and faith in the one true God who stays with us, whose presence is actually sufficient for us. And in that journey together, in this place, finding that presence here, can we take it out into that world? on World Communion Sunday? Can we be the presence for the world the way God's presence is for us that gives meaningful relationships that take us through what we think we can't get through ourselves? What could we do for the world with such a presence and a witness out there? I think we're finding out as we journey together listening and learning and sharing and serving together with Jesus Christ, nurturing relationships, re nurturing relationships with each other, with God, that bring healing, hope, and joy to all in this church and in the world beyond. Amen.